Hello, everyone. Can you guys see me and hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Please give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay, if you can see me and hear me. Okay, you can hear me, thank you. Thank you. Okay, loud okay, and clear. Can hear me, thank you. Okay, loud and clear. Thank you very much everyone for joining me today. I'm very, very excited to be bringing this topic to you guys and the guests that I'm bringing to you guys. Uh, Praise is going to join us in a second. I see him backstage already, you guys. Oh my God. Who else is excited like me? I'm adding praise to the stream right now. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for joining us today. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I think you're muted. Really? Um, can you hear me? Hello? I can't hear. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear praise okay? Oh, okay, so maybe it's me. Okay, I'm just I'm just going to check my settings and be sure that I'm not the one who muted something. Okay. Give me All one right. second. I'm going to fix that now. Okay. Did you change the out? Okay. Okay, I can hear you. I can hear you now, Chris. Okay, good. Yay. Okay, we can both hear each other. That's great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, sir. Um, in a minute, I'm going to pass this over to you to just, for the people who don't know you, to, um, I don't even know where you are living if you don't know Chris for away, but we're going to forgive you today, okay? <laughs> I'm going to pass that to you in a minute to just um, give us a brief about who you are, what you do, and uh, we can get the conversation started from there. So over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I'm a curious soul who is asking the questions no one is asking and creating simple <laughs> solutions to complex family life issues. That's the way I love to describe myself. I, By questioning, I've created all kinds of models and solutions that has helped people. And what I say to people is that um, I probably have um, the most effective solutions for family life, you know, across different culture. And I always say that if humanity decides to migrate to mass, it's going to be very, very relevant in mass as well. Okay. But I just love to see myself as a seeker, curious soul, asking questions, creating simple solutions to complex family life problems. That's, that's why. One very interesting way I think I'd like to describe you, Praise, is I, I, I would consider you a positive disruptor. <laughs> One of those people who you're walking straight into what everybody's running away from. And yeah. that's and that's one thing that first caught my attention when I first um, started to listen to you speak is mm. you are the one who initiates the difficult conversations. The conversations that nobody wants to talk about is yeah. where you're going. Yeah. And, and to an extent, I think I'm like that as well. So I could immediately connect um, with that part of you, especially as it relates to family, how we were raised, marriage, those ideologies that have been handed down that are not working. And we yeah. don't want to admit that they are not working. You know, we're all just holding on to these old-fashioned ideologies because of sentiment and 
it was just I was just happy to know that I was not the only one who was crazy like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that. We're we're okay. we're men. Yeah. Okay, so today we're talking about parenting. We're yeah. talking about parenting the 21st century child. Yeah. Would be would be naive to pretend and say that um, the way we were raised, the methods our parents used are 100 percent still effective today. Mm. Now, that's not to say everything our parents did, everything was wrong with how we were raised, no. Mm -hmm. But I just find that it's becoming very necessary for us to question the components of how we were raised that's not relevant to our children today. Yeah. And one of the conversations I want us to have. So yeah. when we talk about a 21st century child, let's start from there. Who exactly is a 21st century child? Um. The best way to describe a 21st century child is for you to first rewind and go back to your childhood. Where did you grow up? And um, what, how did you grow up? Um, if you're listening to me and you lived in Africa and you are 40 and above or 35 and above, most likely you were born into typewriter. Born into that era where if you live in Nigeria or you live in Cameroon or you live in Ghana, where the biggest banks in those countries had electric typewriter and they were considered as elite organization, big organization, right? But in that circle, the typewriters gave way for desktop, that if you had a desktop, you were, I mean, when I was in the university in Nigeria, um, I didn't see a, a computer, but I took a course on Genesis 201, which was computer. I didn't say computer at all, all through that course, right? And that was 1996, 1996, I was in 200 level, right? And so we didn't even understand computer. We didn't know. When I was opening my email address, I paid money to open yahoo.com, right? So I want to take you on a journey. I paid money to open yahoo.com and I didn't even know how to use it, right? Now, fast forward, desktop gave way for, for laptop, laptop gave way for iPad, iPad gave way for chips. So you have a group of children who are now, who were not, who are not, you, we were born and we learned to use computer. They were born with computers and with gadgets. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't have, we, I mean, when I was growing up, all we talked about was going to heaven. There was no conversation about humanity will go to mass, right? You have children who are living in the era where they're talking about mass. There was nothing called internet. There was internet. They were born when internet was around. They are talking blockchain te technology. They're talking about, you know, all kinds of things. Now, 21st century kids are basically Generation Z and Generation Alpha. If you have a child that is less than 23, that's Generation Z. If you have a child that is less than 11, that's Generation Alpha. Now, they are totally different from us. We were Generation X and Y, totally different. So I believe, and that's why I say to parents that this is the generation that maybe God has sent to question everything we couldn't question and mm -hmm. to open our eyes to what we held as true that is not totally correct because they are going to question you. And that's the problem I think a lot of parents are having that they couldn't situate their own reality to this reality to say, hey, when I was growing up, I couldn't even question my parents. My parents probably beat me without even knowing what I did, and I was okay. I They slammed the religion on me. I couldn't question. There were questions in your heart you couldn't even ask out, but this generation will ask all kinds of questions. They don't no hold back. You know, so it's an interesting generation, and it's a generation that we need to accept rent a space in their head and now guide them uh, but it's not a generation you want to impose your will on because that never works absolutely i totally agree with you praise like that that um handing things down to us you do what i say not what i do you do it because i say so and and for some reason the popular response that we hear is oh my parents beat me my parents did this to me i i hear a lot of people brag about things that are borderline emotional abuse and we say but i turned out well yeah but i turned out well I'm, i find that very confusing from what you have seen from your experience what would you say are like the struggles that the people who were raised in my generation your generation the people who are claiming that we turned out well what are like the 
what would you say are the things you see that indicate to us that we actually did not turn our well? Because I don't think we did. We're, we're traumatized. And um, trauma is something that Africans can't process because it's classified as discipline, even mm -hmm. though it's not discipline, even though it's domestication and punishment, right? And so we, we brag, we create narratives. You know, it's like when people die in Africa, instead of us to find out what killed them, we just say it's the will of God. You know, mm -hmm. they are now in heaven. We never fact find and troubleshoot because we like to console ourselves that everything is fine. That's why they called us at some point the happiest people on earth. I don't know the metrics and the definition of happiness, right? So the same way when we say we turned out better, um, what do we mean by we turned out better? Are we leading the world in anything? That's the question. Are we the one talking about going to mass? Are we featuring in any of the Fortune 500 companies? When they want to talk about climate change, do they invite us there as mm -hmm. a subject matter expert? Yes, um, you know, is Africa now the most desirable place to live in? You know, because um, how you judge is the environment. People create their environment. If I put you in a house now and the house is excellent, in two weeks, the house will take your image. It will begin to look like you. If you're an excellent person, the house will be prim and proper. If the house becomes disorganized, wherein you have a dining table, but you never eat on that dining, you carry your food in your hand and you sit down to watch TV or you eat the, the food in your room, it's already showing us your patterns, right? So a disciplined people will create a disciplined society. If your society is not disciplined, then it's something else. Then we now need to find out what it is. Oftentimes it's domestication because a typical African lives under the military rule. So we were domesticated and we call the discipline. Slapping is called discipline, but the word discipline is a Latin word, disciplina. Disciplina means to groom, to instruct, to correct, and to disciple. Within the context of discipline, there is no shouting, yelling, um, there is no beating and any of the things that we do. Now, hmm. it, it would interest you to know hmm. that in the Japanese culture, parents don't pass any opinion on a child in the first six years. They observe the child, they respect the child, they guard the child, but they don't throw tantrums that we throw. Then from 7 to 14, they teach the child stewardship, respect, and ownership, and collaboration, right? And so you can see the best cars coming out of Japan. You can see precision coming out of Japan. You can see Japan being a first world country, right? So if our own parenting template is producing leaders, who have done their own generation, they have done their children's generation, they are now doing their own grandchildren's generation because when I was in, when President Buhari was, the, when his first coming in Nigeria, 1983 to 1985, I, I was in primary school, right? And my son is out of primary school. President Buhari is still the president of Nigeria, right? So you begin to ask yourself, how can a, I mean, so you look at the other presidents in the world, president of New Zealand, is less than 40. You look at President mm -hmm. Macron, he's in his 40s. You look at the Prime Minister of um, of Canada, you know his age, you know. So, mm -hmm. so look at those kind of metrics. And so in my country, I can I can't see a minister as I like. In America, I can walk up to anybody and talk to anybody, right? In Canada, I was in Canada for two weeks and I talked to a federal minister. You know, so these are things that, so if you are listening to me, there is insecurity in your life um there is low self-esteem you are jealous of other people you can't collaborate you are fearful of death of demons you are um afraid of what the future will hold right um or you are yelling shouting screaming spanking right those are symptoms of domestication in fact it's the badges and the degree that you earn for going through the school of domestication and you passed out with flying colors and I'm sure that almost everyone listening to me passed through that school because we cannot be talking about we turn out right. Turning out right is the fact that well, we are calm. Even when we are being molested, we cannot shout. We cannot speak against evil. We hate evil, but when evil is around, we worship evil. When evil now turns away, we say it's a bad leader. Right? If that is you, then you can't say you are disciplined. You were domesticated because the children of the people we claim were not disciplined are the countries many of us live in right now. The children of those people who say we're not disciplined 
And the ones giving us a better life are the ones inventing everything we're using. We are on Zoom. Whose children created Zoom? We are the internet. Whose children created the internet? We are. We all use Facebook. We all use um, um, Instagram. We use Snapchat. Whose children created all those things? So if we say our we turn out well, me has turned us to be users, begging bulls of the world, where we go for meetings and we are begging, we collect debts we don't want to pay back, right? Then that's not turning out right. You know, we are just creating a narrative, an adjective of convenience to console ourselves. Truth is, we were traumatized, and trust me. That trauma is still living with many of us. Unfortunately, many people are already passing it to their children. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's showing up. It's now starting to show up in the way we parent. I yeah. like I like the way we're doing this, like going back to just paint a picture of the systems in which a lot of us were raised. So be, just listening to you talk about that like that is just showing me like the things that were seen in our children today, especially for those people who have now moved out of Nigeria and then you're in a new country where it seems like the, the culture is different. The way of yeah. life is different. It now becomes a clash of cultures, like which one should bow for the other. Right. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of um, clash is going on. And what would you say to, I have two children who are under the age of 11. Hmm. So I'm raising two generation alpha children. Hmm. And some days, trust me, it gets very exhausting. It does get exhausting, like keeping up with all the things that we have to get um, along with to be able to raise these children. Like it was a, a lot of exhausting and painful work before a short while ago, before my brain received factory reset. <laughs> I had to go and get help. You know, and I took one of your training courses and I'm praised. One of the things that was like a major standout for me in that course is beyond just going back to my own childhood, childhood to talk about how was I raised? What were the things that I would like to see differently from how I was raised? There was also a lot of conversation about scripting the child, understanding yeah. the child. I find that that's where a lot of us struggle. Mm -hmm. Not not 100% because we don't want our children to turn out well, but it's like there are lots of competing priorities. How yeah. do we do it? Especially for those of us who are parents in the diaspora, how do you really create that balance so that you're providing that the, the time you need to really observe a child, to really now understand? Because the example you used about Japan, the first one to six years, yeah. they are observing their children. Like, how do you do that if you have to work these long hours? Some people combine two jobs, no help, no grammar. Like, how? How? Where do we start that from? It's it's community. Um, we in another way, you know, that we were domesticated is we are suspicious of ourselves. We have no sense of community. So um, if a Japanese, uh, if a, if a, um, an Indian moves to America or moves to Canada, he has a village he's going to settle into. Is the Indian village, right? And so there's a sense of community. They know it's Indian. They know what to expect. You know why? Every Indian family operates with the principle called fraternity, which is taught from home. The Japanese have six values that is taught from home. The educational system is built on it. You know, the Emirati, everyone. Africa, in fact, if you even say Africa, Africa is like a narrative that even doesn't exist um, practically. Because you now ask, which of the Africa are you talking about? North Africa, Africa Central Africa. Because, again, they also have different culture. Then if you now say West Africa, what, which West Africa are you talking about? The Francophone or the Anglophone? If you now say Nigeria, which of the Nigerian are you talking about? The Igbo, the Yoruba, the Edo, the Idoma, the kind of... You know, so when it comes to ethnics, we exist. When it comes to nationhood or continent-wide, we don't exist. Even though people um, talk about we exist, it doesn't because it's not been articulated. So when you meet an African, you don't know the work ethics to expect. You don't know the character and the persona to expect. It's not the same for several other cultures. Now, in fact, if you behave contrary, you are an exception to the rule. You are not the norm. For us, we are almost like the norm because when you look at it, so who is likely going to um, mess things up for you? You know, they will mention our people and it's so sad, right? Um, so... Mm -hmm. But, but that's not an excuse. We What we now need to begin to do for those of us in diaspora is we say it takes a village to raise a child. That's an African adage. The people, mm -hmm. so a, a village cannot be the village you came out from. If you send, I don't know your village, Marina, if you send your child back to your village now, to say it's take a village to raise a child, your child is going to come back totally messed up. 
you know, uh, because the, the village you left is probably worse than the one you even lived in. So now you need to create your village, which means a group of 10 other parents who you share similar ideologies, similar values, and you can become a village where each family has become a clan. Now, that way, you can agree on the metrics and the methodology for raising children because you can, the new rule of parenting is scripting. To say we can script our children together, right? And so if everyone is in sync and they are truly a village, then you can collaborate to say, when I go on my long hours, I know someone else is watching my child. Um, when they go, I know I am here. That is what we lack. And let me tell you this. Africans are not strong on systems. We're strong on emotion, right? And system is what works here. In, 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 in the UK, where they use a lot of the train and the metro station and the underground metro lines, if you say the train is coming at 7 o'clock, you are sure train is going to arrive at 7 o'clock. If it says the train will depart 7.05, even if the prime minister is late, the train will depart. In Nigeria, for example, if a minister is going to be on the board of an aircraft to within Nigeria and it's time to board and fly, the minister has not arrived. They can ground that plane for two hours, right? So we don't have respect for time. And also, we can't understand system because we don't understand precision. Precision is the language of innovation. Physics is about precision. For our language, we don't understand precision. If you ask a typical person, African, they say, what is it by, what is, what time, what is it by your time? He's going to say to 11. There is nothing called to 11. There is nothing called to, to uh, 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 there's nothing called past, past five. There is no precision. And if you go to our language, right, there is no precision. If we want to perform experiments, and I say to you, Marina, in your local language, mix lilac with burgundy. What's lilac in your local language? What is burgundy in your local language? So you can see that we have not grown and developed over time. So if we want to do it right out here, it's either we become mother, which means one of you will need to stay at home, which almost is impossible, or we now learn to build systems where we can create a village. Fortunately, the church system or the mock system can actually help. But the, the mm -hmm. class even there don't even understand. So you have a junior church, for example, that a child goes to every Sunday, 52, um, 52 weeks in a year. And I always ask the pastors, for example, that if I make the head of ISIS, your junior church leader, for 52 weeks, who will your children become? They all say terrorists. Mm -hmm. How come we can't predetermine who these children become by coming to church every, every week? So there has to be a handshake, a collaboration, where we can even collaborate to set up centers for African kids, where African kids are raised. It's one of the things I'm doing next year. I'm setting an online platform for African kids where every week I'm going to um, get my team to work with them, you know, virtually, so that they can at least help their parents who maybe don't know what to do or they are too busy and things like that. So we're going to engage them and create a predictable outcome. So system intelligence is what we lack and it's something we need to begin to embrace. Um, so once we begin to say our community, our village, for example, I got to Dallas, started working in Dallas like four months ago. Already we're setting up a village here, right? We met like three times and it's looking good. I've created the vision, the values, you know, everybody's discussing it, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're watching the process right now. Because that is the only way. If we set up villages, we have another village <laughs> somewhere in the UK, in Edinburgh, that I help some people set up and stuff. If we begin to set up our villages, we will become the ancestor of a new generation. Our children will learn by observation. Their children will learn by observation. That's how you change your generation. generation. You can't live um, in Lagos in, in Canada, which is what our people still try to do. You know, they are mm -hmm. in Canada, but it's as if they are still in Ibadan. They are still in, you know, Oyo and things like that. Yeah, there are aspects of our culture we need to embrace, which defines us, but we need to now put it on a system so that it's not subject to emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Where you say, who is my child? How do I raise this child? And who do I need to become to get this child to become the best version of himself? So it's not subject to what I like to do. It's subject to what I need to do to create True. this outcome. Wow. 
I hope that village that you're creating in different places, please, you add Saskatoon to the list because we honestly need that. I'm seeing some comments in the in the chat where people are talking about the division among um, Africans, in especially in diaspora. Like we don't yeah. have a proper African community. So going back to um, for those of us who are now learning about this for the first time, who are maybe already making those mistakes of domesticating our children because that's what was sold to us as discipline. What can we what can we do from here? I'm looking at this question that um, Oge put up. She says, I have two boys below six years who are nearly uncontrollable. Yesterday, a new smart TV got broken. This morning, the white walls are painted in pink marker. Do we just sit and observe? For, okay. for for a parent like this, who <laughs> wants to do better, who wants to know better, what can we do from here? Um, okay, your children are not to blame at all. You can't blame them. You are pretending not to know that that behavior is age-appropriate and expected behavior. Your children will be bad and uncontrollable if they sat down and at the meeting and say, let's say junior and um, princess we are going to break this screen today if that happened then they are wicked if that never happened then is it appropriate so what i usually say is if you are raising toddlers you need to keep everything that they can destroy at a particular height that they can't reach and you need to create i mean i'm i'm um with my cousin he's got two children ages three and two right I am setting up a space for them that is their space because every time they come to their parents' place, they turn it upside down, which is age appropriate anyway. You know, every time we hold a child in our hand and the child is born and we get excited, we don't know what we're signing up for. You are signing up for when it starts to work, it's going to pull everything down. It's going to turn everything upside down, you know, which is part of growing, right? Mm -hmm. It's The child is discovering his environment, exploring his environment. So if you put your smartphone, it's going to smash it. It's not wicked. It's just the interpretation he has about smartphone is, oh, mommy just bought me a new toy. Let me explore it, right? So it's not wickedness. What the adults need to do is to keep everything that is valuable at a space and a place where their hands cannot touch. So what you need to do is to now understand what age are these children. With everything your child is doing, there are things you are not picking. You're only looking at what is being destroyed. Your children are sending you signal right there may be an engineer there there may be an explorer there there may be a scientist among them right now but you are feel you are feeling the pain of what was broken right there's a painter in there who is already expressing himself sending you a signal but you can't pick the painter who can now um that skill can be developed what you are thinking about is the pain so if you have a painter for example to say okay they want to paint can we create their own board can we create their own world can we sit with them and show them this is how you do this, this is where you paint? Can we admire and clap for their painting and say, oh, this is what it can we even hang it and appreciate that those painting? You know, those are things that parents need to learn. You know, I went somewhere and um, we went to a beach out in, in Nigeria um, years ago, and my son took my iPad along. My son does not know that there are people who steal things. It was not on his radar, it was about I think six. And he, he, he finished playing his game on the iPad and he wanted to swim. Put it at the at the bay, at the resort and put his clothes in there and went out to, to, to swim and someone stole the iPad. And I had valuable information there. He was even afraid to come and tell me. But so someone managed to tell me and say, oh, Chris, your son is so distraught. He's lost his, your iPad and blah, blah. And I said, okay, lost my iPad. So I said, things were lost. I mean, it's a thing that was lost. It was not a beam that was missing. Mm -hmm. Right. I said, so bring my son, you know, so I brought him, I held him close and I told him, I love you. Right. You are not, you don't, it's not your fault. Right. It's the environment because you couldn't have thought that there was, a, there were thieves who would steal iPad and things like that. I said, just so next time I taught him about being careful and maybe hand it over to, so what we discussed the lessons he has learned, right? Every time things go wrong is an opportunity to discuss lessons and to remind your child of who your child is. Right. So my sister, if you are feeling bad, it was a thing that was broken. It wasn't a pain that was broken. Right. So you want to check the arrangement of your house and your space and the expected behavior for children within the age range of your child. You have a six year old and a four, a two year old. So ordinarily, mm -hmm. there are two roles you need to be playing because ages zero to three, you are a scout. Ages four to six, you are a model. Right. So you are going to play dual role of a model to 
the six-year-old and the scouts to the three-year-old. Parenting is never easy, but when you have knowledge and you create systems, you know, and you are aware of what you need to be aware of. So, for example, I, when my children were within your age range, I mean, my child, my last child is 10 now. My son is 13, going to 14. When they were that age range, we kept things at a particular height, right? And so it was it was almost impossible for anything to get broken except they accept their toys. You know, we were very, very careful. So you need to keep changing your environment to conform to the age appropriate behavior in your children and that means you need parenting knowledge basically so i empathize with the broken screen but it wasn't yeah, your children, right <laughs> don't worry those children by the time it begins to end from painting and from exploration they will buy you much more screen so enjoy the moment <laughs> and close, right because parenting is actually very interesting and enjoyable if you have expanded awareness Absolutely. And, and you know, Prince, what I'm hearing you say is that for every behavior we see that we interpret a certain way, there's actually another way to look, look at it. Uh, after, I took, after I took that session with you, I learned to start to look at my children differently. Like I've yeah. shared it on this on my channel before, talking about how my daughter wants to play with all her toys at the same time. Mm -hmm. When we teach about, oh, you have to keep a clean room for her, her idea of place, you empty out the whole box of yeah. the toys and play with all of them at once. Yeah. When I walk past, I see a mess. But for her, that girl is very creative. Looking at her again after I learned that training was like skills fell from my eyes and I began to see things. My daughter can cut her socks and used to make a dress. I already know that there's a designer in her. So now what I'm learning to do, I told my people, I went to Dollarama and bought a box of cheap, cheap socks Good. and say, if you want to cut, cut this one. This uh -huh. one is for school. You know, there was another time where I walked past her room. All her stuff is on the ground at the same time. I'm like, this girl, the room is always so messy. But I walked into the room and saw that she had a flu, couldn't go to school. So she put all her stuff on the ground in the middle of her bedroom and recreated her classroom. Uh -huh. She put a big stuff in front to be the teacher but when I walked past that room, from my point of view, I saw a mess. I saw yeah. all her toys on the yeah. ground at the same time. But going closer, she was recreating her classroom because she yeah. was missing school. Yeah. You know, and I've heard one other example you gave about uh, somebody who had said their children are always climbing heights and trying to jump, and they're yeah. four, but we are worried they will hurt themselves. And the solution you gave was, if the person is four and they're trying to jump from a height that's too much for them, give them the jump for a four-year-old instead of saying, don't jump. Yeah, you know, so just the is the response. Yeah. What I think the problem is is our interpretation and the response that we give to those things that we mislabel. It, it, it's the so, biggest. Yeah. It's the biggest problem we have, Marina. Have you not noticed that there was a picture of Bill Gates with his room in a mess? What we would call mess, mm -hmm. you know, on the internet. How did the parents manage to record it? It meant they had awareness to know that this is not just a mess. Thomas Edison's image with his first factory in his house. Is on the internet. So the things we get angry about, some of them interpreted properly and they help the child, you know, become the best version of himself. So our interpretation is always right and wrong. No, right and wrong is the lowest yeah. level of interpretation. There's, there are higher interpretation. If you go closer, so for example, like I always say, if you're from Africa and you, you get, gotta get into your child's room, your daughter is 11 and you see her sleeping, two legs are to the wall. How do you interpret that behavior? Now, ah, if you have a lot of home video, <laughs> bad movies, you would say she has gone travel for um witches meeting. How can putting two legs to the wall be witches meeting? What are the <laughs> other interpretations? Could that be a new a new sleeping style? Could it be something? Could she have forgotten herself there? There are so many possibilities, so many interpretations, but you choose the one that resonates with you. Never forget, you have been scripted by the people that raised you. You are the product of their engineering system. You are their report card. So your beliefs are not your beliefs. Your beliefs are mostly imposed beliefs that you have accepted in your mind based on the reality of the people that raised you. So you cannot raise a new generation because if you raise your child to become you, the best your child will be is you. And I'm sure you don't even like you because you know you can do better than you. But the people that raised you, they raised this you to become this you that you don't like. Now that's what you're attempting to raise your child to become. So you see that there is so much generalization, gross um, ignorance on many platforms of people teaching. And that's why, I mean, you ask parents, for example, every parent I know want to raise a godly child. Ask them to define a godly child. They don't know. But they want to raise what they don't know. 
They want to raise what they are. So it's a cliche. I want to raise a godly child. So how are you planning to raise a godly child? The only way they know is prayer. So I ask, which godly child has been raised alone by prayer? They don't know because of the worldview. So Africa copied, um, African Christians copied child education from the, the Jews. But Jews don't just do child education. Jews have a 14-year parenting curriculum that terminates at the festival called Bat Mitzvah. So if you pick a six-year-old Jewish child, you know what he should have been, been taught. If you pick a nine-year-old, everybody knows what he should have been taught. They have that curriculum. Every household has it. They put a child with a mentor, right? So they, they, the parents, the grandparents already took a life insurance for the grandchild. So by the time he's 18, the child is not coming into poverty. He's already made. So these are the back-end things that we don't understand. We just copy the one that is convenient for us. So parents first need to admit, if you are listening to me, you need to, and if you love your child, you need to first admit, I don't know. I have not been taught. Then to now seek knowledge, because if you don't change your world, I, I tell people, if you knew me, you would, you would appreciate the growth that has taken place in me. I stood on the podium in the year 1997 as somebody in the fellowship on campus in University of Adoikiti. And I was teaching passionately that ladies who wore trousers were going to air fire. Ladies who wore women were going to air fire. Based on the conditioning that was put on my brain. Now when I look back at those things, I laugh at myself and say, praise, what ganja were you smoking when you were teaching all these things? But it's a product of conditioning. So the same way you are a product of conditioning. So when I, my children do stuff and I am not angry and we are having conversations, even my wife is stunned. To say, how did you become this? Trust me, you can become anything you want to become once you have enough awareness. Because I have enough awareness. I know what is going on. So I'm able to relate with people's children. People send their children to me to say, preserve school judgment. And after, a, I mean, a lady was, a girl was telling me, sent me a message yesterday. This girl was 14 when her mother was almost going to disown her because she was sending her privates to people in her school and blah, blah, blah. So when they brought her, I knew. That that behavior couldn't have been an isolated behavior. I investigated the classroom and I realized that every child in that classroom was doing what she was doing. So I worked with her. So she was so eager yesterday to send me a uh, um, result from graduating from secondary school and to tell me, Mr. Priest, thank you for understanding me because my parents didn't understand me until you came in. That we need to embrace education, embrace awareness. And many of you need to fix yourself. The pain of your childhood is being passed to your child unconsciously. Some of you are in pain. You have not addressed the pain. You need to heal because it takes a wholesome parent to raise a wholesome child. Many of us are traumatized. You cannot give what you don't have. If you squeeze praise and yekini or mukaila comes out, then I am mukaila, right? What comes out of you when you are squeezed? You, some of you, you are not even squeezed. Just a behavior by a child, you are ready everywhere. You are rushing everywhere. You are reporting your child to everyone. You need to master how to raise a child in the 21st century. And trust me, when people say, my teenager doesn't listen to me. No, you are pretending that that child was born as a teenager. It's the report card of what you did in the toddling year. And parenting is an 18-year curriculum. Age 19 will show your report card. So we need to embrace knowledge, basically. And once we have enough awareness, our repertoire of interpretation will increase. And we will see that there are other ways to interpret a behavior outside of the one side, uh, one shoe fits it, size fits it all kind of thing that we are doing, which has definitely messed up a lot of children. Absolutely. One size fits all. That's one mistake I used to make. Try the same patterns for both my children until I had to sit down. Um, after doing the scripting, my husband and I, we realized our children were very, very different people. So there's no way that's what happened to us. Our parents put all of us in the same box and did all of us the same way. You know, I had my immediate younger sister is the, she's, I think my daughter took after creativity from her. I don't know yeah. if those things are passed down, but she's very yeah. good at her hands. She can sew, she could do hair, her makeup on point. Now she makes luxury candles, body butters wow. inside her house. Wow. She has a luxury line of organic skincare material she was wow. the hands-on one but for me i was always the book one i was the one mm. who liked to think and analyze from books so i was not very creative with my hands but it just seemed like that part was a defect for me because i was not like my sister i was mm. not creative with my hands like her so for the longest time it was like people put us against each other 
Mm. You know, it was always like, oh, why are you not like this? Why? And I know that those things scarred me. For the longest time, it affected the relationship I had with her at some point. Because mm. that comparison was always, your sister has long hair. What happened to you? You know how those people want to get married? They come to my mom and say, oh, mama, I want one of your daughters. I want your daughter to be my little bride. They, my mother has three girls. They, they don't come and say, I want daughter this to be little mm. bride. They say, I want your daughter to be my little bride. And she's like, which one? They say, ah, which one before? The pretty one. And it was not me they were oh, talking about. Wow. You know, as silly as it sounds, those things started to affect my relationship with my sister because mm. I looked at her and I did not see an ally. I saw a mm. competitor. Mm. It was like both of us had to compete for everything, mm. for the love of our parents, for who is the prettier one to be on the bridal train. We laugh about it now. But that's because both of us have come to the point where we know that, look, those people did what they what they did from the place where they were, the mm -hmm. ignorance where they were. But it robbed me of a relationship with my sibling for the longest time, mm. you know? So for those of us, for people like me, for people like my sister who are struggling with relationships because of the kind of parenting they had, what is the hope? Like, where do we... Because some of the trauma that is showing up in how we're parenting today, some of us have not dealt with it. We have not even mm. come to terms to even admit to ourselves that... As much as this thing was not done from a malicious place, it affected me. Yeah. I am hurting from this thing. I have not moved past it. And you know, when you talked about trauma in the beginning, to say we don't know how to process trauma, I would feel really silly saying what I just said in public, to say, you know, actually, because they didn't used to pick me as little bride, they hurt me. People mm. are going to laugh at me and say, get over yeah. it, come on, move on, just snap out of it. But those things add up. Those little yeah. things that make you question yourself, second guess your value, those are the things that show up today some, yeah. in our lives, how we're yeah. parenting our children. Yeah. Yeah. So for people like that, where do we even start from? Where do we start to deal with our own trauma from before we can even raise wholesome children? We, we need to heal. I'll give you a story. Um, so I, I was sharing during the week, talking about how my father moved from places to play. My dad was an Anglican priest. And so my father traveled everywhere. Two years, they will pu push him from one place to the other. If the bishop never liked him, they put us inside a bush. You know, so I always frequently change schools. Now, how did that affect me? Because I frequently changed school. I, I had too many best friends in too many schools. So now a pattern of not being faithful to any cause or any human being was already established because I was always moving. Now, if I had not gotten help, maybe I would have been out of, out of marriage. Do you understand? Now, as I share that story, one of my old friends reached out to me and he said to me, he said, praise, let me tell you something for the first time. Are you aware that when you left our school, he affected me badly that I couldn't get close to anyone and it's still affecting me now? Now, you can see how that's a trauma. People just move on and say, oh, what's the big deal? Somebody left. No, it's a trauma that nobody paid attention. We just assume the child will, you know, but it messed many of us up. You need to get help. I sat in front of a therapist to process my pain. And that's why I help people process their pain and take them through healing. I mean, I've seen adults break down in front of me crying because of unprocessed trauma, right? You just think you, you love to beat your child. You don't love to beat your child. You've been conditioned to beat your child. There's trauma in you. There's beating in you. You think you love to yell? No, you were conditioned to yell. Do you think you, because when you woke up in the morning, did you write on to your to-do list today? I'm going to slap my child. I'm going to get angry and yell. And my heart will begin to palpitate. Nobody puts that on there. Everybody wants a good day. But how come your day is inter I mean, interrupted by an interpretation? Because everything you see in life is raw data. It is your mind that ascribes meaning to things. So if you look at your child and the house is scattered, and you say, oh, wow, my child is getting creative. You want to observe some more. Maybe bring out your phone and snap what the child is saying and say, when he clocks 21, I'm going to show him, right? And you're smiling. But another person looks at it and says, the house I just finished, you know, arranging. You scatter the house. What mood, your interpretation affects your feelings. So you begin to get angry and your action is the next thing. You slap the child. At the end of the day, you're asking yourself, what have I done, really? But you have also passed trauma to that child. So healing is the first thing to do. And when I talk about healing, I'm not talking about going up, going out of water cold and somebody laying down on you. No, you need to process that pain and you give a new meaning to it. You need to change the narrative at a deeper level because what we do in healing work is changing the meaning. 
once we go back you change the meaning and you see how it has um led to where you are right now where it's taking you to it becomes very easy and once that changes you realize that everything about you change and it's not out of place to sit before a professional to get help right because we mm-hmm. always think ah does it mean i have mental health problem no it's not out of place i did that you know and it did help because I was already battling with depression at some point because I couldn't, I just hated life. I hated God. I hated everything. I was dropping out of everything for two years, right? So you can actually sit and get help because you are supposed to be a blessing to your child. But if you are not careful, you can be a curse to your child where you teach your, in fact, my mentor taught me, he said, let your children not be able to associate pain to your hand. Let them be able to associate want to your hand. So he taught me not to use my hand to slap or beat my children he said, when they think of their father's arm, um, you know, he said, because in God's right hand, um, there's fullness of, I mean, in, God, in God's presence, there's fullness of at his right hand, there are pleasures. Pleasures. So your children experience pleasure. That even when the public and the outward had gone against them, the society has gone against them, they can always feel, I have a home to run to. And I know yeah. I'm accepted here. Because when your child is, I mean, traumatized by the society and they, is traumatized at home, that's why you are seeing that more Gen Z are having bouts of depression, are having, because, I mean, especially for those of them who live in diaspora, they, are, they don't mm-hmm. have a sense of village where they see people like them in Nigeria and they can talk to. Here, they see people who have different colors, who are, some of them are racist, not all of them. You know, some of them look down on them and they yeah. don't even have friends to hang out with. So they don't understand your language from home. They are not accepted here. So they are literally floating. So yeah. home now becomes a fortress where they know that even if the whole world, you know, doesn't accept me, I am accepted here. I am celebrated here. But you can't even celebrate them when you are traumatized yourself. So you need to lean and you need to be able to process what is going on for you to be able to help. If, if you have not heard anything that Praise has said today, I hope that nobody forgets that. Like for your children, they're already dealing with so much outside of the house. And if they cannot come home and find fortress, if they cannot come home and find warmth with you, their parents, well, there, there's, an, there's an increasing number of, like we hear the stories of immigrant kids who are getting involved in drugs, going to juvenile jails and things like that. I don't, it's not village people. It's not everything that is village people. Sometimes if we put these things on the table, the patterns are there. The patterns yeah. are there. The precedent was there. We just did not notice. We didn't know and, how to... And, in fact, Marina, on, on what you just touched now, I also think we now need to begin to advocate that um, we, if they are sending a child to juvenile home, we need to advocate that they have African professionals who understand the African child. Because mm-hmm. I realize that the, the, the North American professionals of therapies don't have a clue about who an African child is, and that becomes a problem. I mean, I work with a girl here who had been in therapy for seven years, and in 13 days, we're able to clear everything, right? Because the people working with you here, they, they are, your reality is not their reality. So, for example, they would not believe that some of us hawked um, plantain chips in traffic as children. Now, so if you if, if that is not on your radar, they don't know that some of us before we we had something called up nepa in Nigeria, right? They, they would not know that you read with candle in school and lanterns. It's not on their radar. So how do they process what they don't even understand? So we need more social workers who are Africans. We need more therapists who can now begin to say, hey, this is an African behavior as it were, and there are ways to, to resolve this. Because or else they will just keep pumping our children with medication. And I don't think many of those children actually need medication because that creates another problem for them. Totally, totally, totally agree. Uh, there's hope. That's what I'm getting from this. No matter how bad the history has been, there is hope. And as far as you're still alive, you have an opportunity to rescript and rewrite what your story can be. Please, if you have questions, just drop them in the comment section. Let's see. Um, how many questions praise can take before we wrap up the conversation. So I've gotten a couple of questions that came to me privately. I'm going to read one. Uh, This is quite long and I wanted to start with it. Uh, This person says, I have OCD and anxiety. And since I got married, I have learned to be flexible. But now my daughter is exhibiting the same tendencies. The difference is 
when I was growing up, my parents gave me my space. Until today, I still have a self-contained in my parents' house. So people don't touch my things or mess up my space. Now my daughter's own is making me impatient because I don't have the same luxury as my parents give to me uh, to allow me be myself. And there's no help. Okay, so it sounds like this parent lives in the diaspora. There's yeah. no help. Everything is on me as the parents. How do I balance it? Um, now, when you say you had OCD, were you clinically diagnosed? That's the first question I love to ask. If you were not clinically diagnosed, because I don't like labels. Um, it, so, I mean, so a child that has OCD, for example, could have been a creative convertible, right? Um, which is a personality type, you know, but of course, it's not captured in conventional learning, um, you know, but from what you're even saying, your child is sounding like a create a, a systematic thought. Systematic thoughts are perfectionist. They want their thing. My space, my mommy, my daddy, my space, my thing, right? There is a way to work with systematic thoughts in a way that, you know, you incorporate and begin to teach them because they're systems driven. So you need to stylishly or bypassing conscious resistance, bring in their people's side, right? On them to, sh on the need to share because leaving them alone to themselves is not also going to be helpful because they're going to live in a larger society. So if they, um, if they get married for it, which is already what you're, you're experiencing, your parents try to do what they could do, but I don't think that's the best um, approach to what they did, you know? So for your child... Uh, Sorry, my <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> you know, so you want to figure out, you know, what's going on with your child and help that child. You see, children are malleable. No child was born with OCD, right? Okay. Children are malleable. You can actually, a child was not born introvert extra, even though those genes may be there. You can environment can condition a child into anything. So you can actually do, there's something we do in class called the child uses manual. You can create your child uses manual. And that gives you a more robust awareness of who your child is, how to get the best out of that child, and how to help the child overcome um, some of the tendencies that could um, affect other people who the child is capable of relating with. That's what I think you need to do. So, but you need to calm down. Um, it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. You need to just grow in your awareness. That's all you, that needs to grow. Once your awareness grows, your understanding of your child grows, every other thing is sorted. Okay. Uh, and then there was another question that came, and I've seen a couple of them in the chat, is when we talk about stubborn children, that has come up a lot. Like uh, strong-willed children are stubborn. In the African yeah. context, if you, if you dare to ask why, if you dare to talk back... For me, I feel like I was that child growing up. Not, I will not say stubborn. I'm just, I was just a very curious child. I used yeah. to ask the whys everywhere until they beat me until the <laughs> the zeal to the curiosity flew out the window because you had to do as you are told and don't ask why. So yeah. when it comes to dealing with children who seem to have their own personality, which all children do, how do we manage strong-willed children? Like I've seen it show up in the comment section a couple of times, like when children don't listen, when they are stubborn, they are not, they are, uh, what's the word? Like rebellious. Like how do you deal with children who are like on that path? There is no child um, that is rebellious and um, there is no child that is stubborn. You only have adults who are unwilling to change their narrative and their worldview. So um, when we say a child is stubborn or when we say a child is bad, I mean, I have a class called Handling an Erring Child. An erring child could be a troubled child. An erring child could be, um, you know, a suspense in the movie, a best-selling movie that is still unfolding. It could be a personality that has not been properly diagnosed. You know, it could be anything, right? So oftentimes what we call stubborn is when things don't go our way. You know, as Africans, we have not been brought up to accept that life is not about this or that. Life can be this and that. Mm -hmm. What that means is Marina and I can look at the same thing and we disagree with each other and we are both correct. So we have not been brought up to accept other people that contradict us. And that's why religion is built on difference. It's not built on similarities. To say everyone who believes, who doesn't believe, what we believe is going to hell. Everyone who doesn't believe, and every religion is saying that. 
So you are wondering which of the gods is determining all of these things. So we need to step down a bit and observe and say, what is stubborn about this child, right? Because a natural leader, a child that we call intimidating honor might be classified as stubborn. Stubbornness means, so let's say your child is stubborn. You say your child is stubborn. Now, you say he's stubborn because everything you ask him to do, he doesn't do. Then you now say, I want this child to be obedient. Now, let's assume your child now goes into the community and he meets a sex predator who says to your child, remove your parents. I want to have sex with you. And your child says, no, that is what you call stubbornness. Will stubbornness be stubbornness at that point or stubbornness will now be empowering? Because you want to teach him to be obedient. If he's now obedient to that predator, is an uncle. Will you clap and say, oh, powerful child, you are obedient. So in a bid to take what we call stubbornness out of the child, we take away their power to resist evil, to question their environment, to embrace what works for them. Because what we often try to do is... We, so when you ask who is, an, who is a godly child, you say it's an obedient child. What does that mean? Obey who? To become what? We need to learn to respect our children because we assume because it's a child, it should not be respected. A child needs to be respected. Respect is reciprocal. So in the Norwegian prison system, they created a mantra that if you treat a human being like an animal, it will respond with the energy of an animal. If you treat a human being like a human being, it will respond like a human being. But if you treat a human being like a royalty, it will respond like a royalty. Now, can you observe your child again and what you call stubbornness, right? Could it be that your child is just strong will or your child is just self-assertive or self-confident? Is that what you're calling stubbornness? Can you engage your child in an intellectual discourse to say, how do you say this? How do I say this? And let me say this to you. Any decision you are taking with Generation Z, it must be collaborative. They must be part yeah. of that decision or else they will sabotage it. So if Absolutely. you ask, what do you think? This is what I think. What do we do? And they agree to do. They will champion it. They will execute it. But if you impose it on them, they will sabotage it because they were not part of it. Right? True. You have a unilateral way of saying things. They have a multidimensional way of saying things. And they always believe that there are several ways of getting to the same destination which you think there's only one way. They don't see it that way. And they have a right to see things differently from you. Can you stop? That's why we say you cannot be a child's teacher without first of all becoming their student. So when you begin to study, can you approach your children from today? I and mean, all of you listening to me, the next one way, don't try to judge anything. Pick your notes. Just observe and take notes to say what are the possibilities here. Once you begin to pick the possibilities, you realize that what you call stubbornness may not be stubbornness. It may be self being self-willed. It may be self-confident. It may be assertiveness skills being displayed. Or it, it could be personality or, or um, temperament or something like that, right? So, but when it has now been established that it's doing a behavior that's not empowering, you now want to find out what are the triggers? What are, I mean, because oftentimes your children reflect one of you, either you or your husband. It reflects one of you. If you check your child, one of you used to be like that. So you are looking at your mirror and you hate your mirror and you want to suppress your mirror, basically. That's what is happening. But if we learn to accept our children, what we say is the child is the seed, is the plant. Let's even say now has a bad behavior or a self-sabotaging behavior. That behavior is weed in agricultural science. You don't attack the plant. You attack the weed. So you reject the behavior. You embrace your child. Many people don't know how to do that. It's a process, right? That you must not, because if you attack the plant, you will destroy the plant. And even if you attack the weed, Without taking cognizance of the plant, you can approve the plant while oppressing the weed. So that's why, for whatever you see, calming down is the first thing you need to do. Calm down, process it, and look at this, and look at why and how. Why it takes you to the root of the issue, how shows you the pattern that is happening. What many of us look at is what? What is it doing? What is it? And what will lead to labeling? It does not provide any solution. So if you learn to calm down, observe things, and you now find out what is the right strategy to help my child. I mean, I meet parents whose children are smoking. And all they see in their child is, is a smoker. Is How can your child just be a smoker? No, it's your child who has a challenge with smoking, right? It's a behavior that I was not born with and that I can live. But you don't define your child totality 
by whatever is struggling with. It's not an acceptable way of dealing with children. Hmm. Wow. So much, so much to unpack here. So, so much. Um, so, Praise, with one of the examples you just used, you used, used an analogy of a predator. Like, if you don't want your child to say no to you, if you don't want them to ask why, if you don't want them to challenge you, they are going to take everything that's given to them outside. Your yes. definition of obedience inside the house can put them in harm's way outside, yes. you know. Yes. So, that's, that's, a, that's an eye-opener. And using that example of um, sexual predation, like the world that we live in right now, everything around us, everything is very highly sexualized. Yeah. How do we have those conversations with our children? When is the right time? From one of the questions I got, somebody says, when is the right time to talk to our children about sex? When can we... Is keeping them away from what is happening, like shielding them and saying, don't watch this, don't watch that. Is that all? Because eventually no. they'll meet these things outside. How do yeah. we have those conversations so that they are hearing from us and we're telling them the truth, not necessarily the version that we want them to know? Um, there is what we call age-appropriate sexuality education. Now, in the world today, that has become a problem because now you have the LGBT sexuality education um, you have the all-inclusive sexual education, you know, but what I say is based on your family values, you have a right to choose the appropriate sexual education you want to uphold, right? And so mm -hmm. if you have chosen the one you want to uphold, then you need to start teaching sexual education from 18 months, actually. There's what to teach from 18 months mm -hmm. to three years. It's called My Body and High. I mean, I have quite a number of um, resources on my website, you know, on how to teach sexual education, what to teach around the year, Right. Um, so 18 months or three years, you teach my body and high. You use songs, you use games, you teach public parts, you teach private parts, um, you teach what to do to the private parts and all. From ages four to six, you teach what we call curiosity and high because your child is asking a lot of curious questions. Um, that's the age where you teach the four golden rules of the body. Rule number one is also a song, my body belongs to me and also belongs to God, rule two. I must report to my dad and mommy whatever happens to me, rule three. I have a right to say no to whatever I feel is wrong, rule four. Anybody that says I should not talk wants to destroy my future, then you take fire on the mountain. Bad movies, bad pictures, bad songs, bad friends, that's fire on the mountain. So run and run and run away, that's fire on the mountain. Now from ages seven to eight, you teach awareness and I. That's where you take the lies of the predator. Your mommy will die, your father will die, your teens will die. You also teach a bit of LGBT education to say that there are people who believe their preference is something else, right? You don't fight them, especially for those of your children who live in diaspora. You don't fight them, but you also have a right to accept who you are, celebrate who you are, promote who you are against all odds, right? Then from ages um, um, 10 to 12, you teach life is good which is where you now introduce them to puberty. You now teach um, or what we call undressing sex, which is defining every reproductive part in a way that can govern human behavior. Then from mm -hmm. 13, 13 to 18, basically, you teach testy and chasty, where you now teach pornography, masturbation, and several other things that they're going to be encountering. You see, what you can do is to empower your child against the predator, where predators are no longer just human beings. Predators are also systems, are also movies, also an environment, right, where your mm -hmm. child must now be taught to accept his identity because a child who has truly mastered his identity cannot be swayed by whatever the world is doing. Your job is to help your child master who he is. That's why you cannot now be the one taking away who he is by yelling, shouting, and screaming because a child whose esteem is intact does not feel he needs anything. So if they offer him uh, marijuana is not going to take it. If they offer him, come and become this other sexual orientation, he's not going to listen. You know, so it's your job to teach age-appropriate sexuality education. And if you mm -hmm. still feel you are too busy to teach that, you can reach out. We can help you teach your child from January next year. Absolutely. My, my, my son is in one of the classes right now. In fact, he had a session this morning. And after every session, we have a conversation about it to say, okay, what was different? The first time he was like, ah, mom, most of the things they said are things you have told me before, we have learned in school. But today it's like for him to be learning that away from like a, from his regular classroom and just learning with other children. Like it's interesting. And I can see the curiosity in him just saying, oh, 
I knew about that. Or this was what they said. What do you think about it? So there's help available. That's the beautiful thing here. And that's the reason why I'm so happy um, that I'm having this conversation with Praise today. There is help available. No matter what you think the history has been, what the it's not it's not it's not beyond redemption whatever is going on with you you're not the first you will not be the last and it's not beyond um redemption a lot of people are saying this conversation cannot be one of uh praise us to come back please you put keep putting it there we have to beg him to come back praise is a very busy person that we have him here is a testimony like this is a this is a reminder for me that dreams come true i know all the times i used to watch you on your view tvc i'm like one day i'm going to either take a class or i'm going to have a conversation with you and it's happening today look at my god <laughs> right uh so i'm trying to scroll to see if we have questions, yes, predators are no longer human beings and their systems. Praise, there's one, one thing you mentioned, that predator, predators are now systems. They are in the environment. They are in our music videos. They are yeah. in the movies that we're seeing. But you see the build, one thing I find very funny is when we see those videos on Instagram of um, children who are at parties and they are dancing in these dancing competitions and you see a three, four-year-old dancing dance steps that are associated with songs that children that age should not be listening to. Yeah. And it has to watch that video more than once before they master that dance like that. But we come and heal them. You will now hear people giving comments like, oh, my ovaries, oh, my daughter must dance like this. But I'm like, are you people not seeing that something is not right with this pattern of children dancing this? Please, is there a way we can be more attentive? Like, how do we even pay more attention to that? All these seemingly harmless things that all of us are hailing and celebrating on the internet. But how do we get people to start to see that these patterns are destructive? And at the end of the day, it might not be in the best interest of the child. Well, I, I, I see it a bit differently. And um, that's what I always say, that um, there is no child that is wayward. You only have wayward adults or irresponsible adults. Um, so if you say you want to do children's birthday party, um, how do you play adult content at children's birthday party? So you pay a DJ to come DJ. and play um, adult content and mess up your children. If you play a DJ, you should determine the playlist. You know, so um, when my son was younger, I think there was a party we went for, and I taught him about adult content, bad movies, bad picture, bad song, bad friends and all. So he went for a body party and they were playing um, adult content. And he went to me, the DJ, to say, please, this children's body party, can you change the whatever? And the person was unwilling. And my son came to me and I said, can we leave this place right now? Because they are unwilling to change this music. And I put him in the car and we left. Right? And you see, for me, I was excited. He's able to spot what is, what is not yeah. appropriate for him. And now, what I always try to do is maybe it's appropriate for other people's parents or they are not just aware because my job is not to be the policeman of the world. My job is to, is to help my child become the best version of himself and everyone who submits to my worldview, right? And, and so um, what I always say to parents is teach your child, script your child to be able to spot what is not good for him, Right? And, and there is this notion that we need to begin to move away from. Africans have become known as dancers, as entertainers. When are we going to be known as innovators, as mm -hmm. inventors, as scientists, right? Because after we have danced and danced and danced, other races are in control of our health care, they're in control of our financial institution, they're in control of the apps that we are using, and we're just going to be dancing, Right? which is why I'm going to appeal to every parent in diaspora. Don't just be quick to say every parent is taking their children for swimming. I am, my child must go for swimming. And mm -hmm. their children for basketball. My child must go for basketball. It's almost like it's a bandwagon effect. True. And so one true. thing I found, my stay in Canada, is um, um, I mean, I was having a conversation, I'm beginning to realize that even these counselors now begin to advise the black kids, some of the black kids to say, Oh, focus on sport at the expense of the academics? I don't think it should be, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's begin to raise children who are thinkers, who can strike a balance, not just children who are twisting their waist and all. Uh, but I think that adults are the ones, you know, that um, you blame for all this kind of thing. So if adults are not aware that adult content should not be played. I mean, I'll tell you, there was a time 
Nickelodeon was coming to Nigeria to, um, and they were going to trade party for children. And all the music artists they invited were artists who sing lewd lyrical content. And I reached out to Nigerian um, um, N NBC or something like that. And I said, no, this is wrong. Um, you can't be bringing children to come and listen to these guys who sing songs that contradict the sanity of our True. children. And they said, well, that's what popular demand wants. That's what parents want. And so they said to me, praise, if you can get 1,000 Nigerian parents to send a petition to us that this artist should not feature, we will take them out. And I went on um, social media broadcasting. We need 1,000 um, signatures. I, you'll be shocked. We couldn't get. Even yeah. the ones who say we are Christian, you know, they were saying the, the, the separates just leave them. One time we did this artist, we not kill them and things like that. So sometimes people pretend as if they want what is right, but they don't want what is right. They want what is popular, right? Yeah. And, and that, that's that's a problem. So what I always say to people is this: is what um, Snoop Dogg said one year. They were going. It was going to shoot a mu musical, and every time his son goes with him to to shoot many of his commercials, and there was a particular one his son didn't go. So the um, the the what do they call them? The journalists ask him, Snoop, why is your son not here? And Snoop said. What we're going to shoot is adult content. He has a lot of nudity, right? So um, my son is not going to be there. So they ask him, but the people who are going to be consumers of what you are shooting are your children's age mate. And you know what he said? He said, well, I am responsible. I'm only responsible for my child. Your Their own parents should be responsible for them. And yeah. you know, when they asked Madonna also, when she won an award, to say, oh, your children must be proud of you watching this award. She said, my children don't watch TV. I don't watch and that's why. said, there's so much toxicity in there that I can't expose my children's mind to the toxic things on the screen. Those are the producers of what your children are watching. If they can do that, what are you doing? The choice is yours. Wow. Wow. You guys. Who? Prince, there's one mighty elephant in the room. I know if we go there, maybe that's what we used to bribe you to come back. Honestly, I'm coming to that, guys. We, we're talking about parenting in this conversation, but there's a place of healthy marriages before we can talk about parenting, but that's a different conversation. We, I'm going to start praying today <laughs> and start doing work. Maybe the next time we'll come, we'll go back to the importance of the two people who are the parents. Let's, let's, if, if the marriage is not in place, the parenting is going to fall apart. Just, Just so slide, into my, so, slide into my calendar, Marina. Let's pick a date and let's do it. Okay. Hey, you guys, please just be round of applause in the comment section. Praise is coming back. So this question, let's take it. What's your take on kids visiting relatives during holidays? I personally think it gives kids low self-esteem, especially when they visit rich relatives. Nothing gives your child low self-esteem. Um, it's not the visiting that gives them low self-esteem. If your child has, I mean, what do we call rich relatives? Is it... It's, what are you exposing your child to? Are you, are you saying you are poor or you're exposing yourself to poverty? No. Um, you, I mean, every... You know, I make my children watch luxury videos on YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's intentional, right? So that when they get to anywhere, they are not moved by anything they see. So it's, really it's your parenting script in your family that you need to tweak, right? Um, a, a child's esteem should not be dependent on... Um, what relative? So because, so the, this conversation is not the child that has self-esteem issues here. Is the parents that are insecure, right? So you need to deal with this and um, and do it properly. Where expose them to the best that they can see. It doesn't have to be. You may not be able to afford everything, but expose them to the best that they can. True. Take a drive around. Go to a fast star hotel. Go to the lobby, sit down there, order for what you can afford. If you can't afford anything there, walk around. They can't chase you out, right? Mm -hmm. so the problem is we always think we need money to afford everything. It's when you don't have money that you should be able to even go and price everything. Go to the car, <laughs> go and buy the latest car, just go and check it, they can't chase you out. They will, what's the case scenario, they will ask you, when are you coming to buy? Um, I want, I'm, I'm expecting something to come and maybe I'll come back. Nobody can chase you out. Because True. you need them as much as you need them. So it's not the relatives 
um, that where, if you have told me that your are uh, the values of your relatives contradict your values. Then exactly, say, oh, exactly. Oh, I was oh, thinking oh, about that. Like it seems like there's another of, issue that we're ignoring. Yeah, children don't even understand what is rich. What children want to play? They want to play. They don't understand all these things except we are the ones highlighting it, right? And so your job is to ensure that your child's esteem is intact. Yeah. If their esteem is intact, they are not moved anywhere they go. So um, YouTube is there to show them what is possible and what is happening around the world. So I think um, with that, your children will be fine. Yeah. Another way to look at this, though, uh, Tabitha, is like Pray said, the first concern I thought they would that would come up from letting children go spend holiday somewhere else is, would there be a clash of values? Are they now going to come back doing things that are normally not allowed in my house, but it's allowed in that other house? Is it going to confuse them? That's what I th thought the first concern would be. Yeah. If you have relatives who have the same values, who see things the same way, like I know for sure, there are some places that my children will not go and do sleepover. There are some yeah. friends that they will not, it's classmates, oh, they're having sleepover here. So no, not every, the fact that it's acceptable in other people's houses doesn't make it right in mine. So I will not send them to a relative that has values that directly conflict with what we're doing in our house. So maybe that's where the first concern should be yeah. is if they say, if there's an alignment of values between both families before it becomes about um, rich relatives, you know. And yes, praise when you don't have money is the best time to go and test drive your the cars yeah, that you like. They cannot force you. <laughs> because poverty, oh, is, in mind, poverty is in the mind, actually. Poverty is in the mind. It's not it's in your bank mind, account. Actually. It's in the mind. <laughs> okay, so I'm just trying to scroll through the comments to see if there's any other question that we haven't touched before we wrap up this conversation. If you have any questions uh, that we that you have not put in, please put it now because we are wrap this conversation is gradually coming to an end. Thank you so much, Praise. I've, I've put, um, let, let me pin the comment again, the website, uh, Praise's website on the screen. So you can go and check out. There's so much information on that website, guys. No matter what you're looking for, you will find something that will point you there. If it's for children, if it's for you, if it's for dealing with past trauma, if you have history that you're not um, tackling yet that is in, interfering with the way you're parenting, there's help available. And Praise yeah. is one of the forces when it comes to this. Is one of you can't go wrong. For me, I'm I'm not ashamed. You people know that I don't have shame will not allow me. Oh, no. I can't come and tell you that everything is perfect. You guys know when I struggle, you know. When I'm taking classes to learn things, you know. I'm I'm getting help for marriage, I'm getting help for parenting, I'm getting help for myself because. You never finish learning, and it, ugh, you guys, please let's let's yeah. make it normal. Let's normalize asking for help. Let's normalize getting professionals, not just necessarily your cell group leader or pastor. The fact that a person is a pastor doesn't make them a professional to handle issues that come with. Do you understand? There's a place for prayer, but there's also a place for professional therapy. And don't let anybody make you feel like it's one or the other. Prayer and therapy is fine. Yeah. It's not prayer or therapy. It can be both, like what Pray said. So, guys, let's normalize that. Let's normalize um, admitting our pain and ad admitting to ourselves that there's pain, there's there's unresolved trauma. No, nothing's going to happen. Nobody's going to die. You um, know? Um, let Pray's me. I have um, I have two classes I would like to talk about, if you don't okay. mind. Um, there's a class called Becoming Indispensable. Um, that class is basically it's three months. Um, it runs every Saturday from December through February next year. And why am I doing that class? Uh, people are reaching out to me to say they have challenges um, scripting themselves first before they script their children. So it's basically a class where you are a house. We're going to tear you down. And you are going to now construct, do an architectural plan of who you want to be. We're going to do a self-audit. Then you're not going to infuse the values and everything, the thought process, your new beliefs, that can deliver who you want to be. It's one of our most, um, you know, immersive sessions. And so if you are interested, um, I am prespare.com slash aliens. That's where you can see that um, class. I mean, you can pay across 10 months, um, you know, so payment plan is available in there. But also if you are a parent, Marina has been through um, the neuros of parenting class and she can tell you, um what's what she gained in there and you really really are interested in that class you can go to i am praiseforward.com slash us slash coach parent right and uh, i mean just indicate your interest and uh, we'll fix the class for you 
And um, if we have 10, 20 people will do that class, you know, but yeah. trust me, um, you cannot, you cannot afford not to know what you need to know, especially yeah. if you're a parent living in diaspora. I think my own assignment right now is to help Africans create villages and help them script their children and themselves for success here. And that's very much clear to me. And so I've researched all sorts. I mean, there are things I can't even say on here um, that I always say in that class for people to know that there's an agenda already. You are not thinking 2062. There is already a document for 2062, for 2090 about you and your children and their grandchildren, you know, in diaspora that you're not aware of. But you now need to go against that document by knowing exactly what you need to do. Um, it's mm -hmm. something we all need to do for ourselves. The classes are affordable. So um, put your money where your mouth, uh, put your mouth where your money is, or put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is, yes. Okay, yeah. I look forward to working yeah. with some of you, and trust me, um, there is a limit to what we can do on this platform. But when we work together across one month, across three months, there's a whole lot that can happen to you, and you need to save yourself before you even save anybody. Absolutely. Uh, so there are a couple of questions about the classes. If people want to get to you, is there an email address I can put on the comments yeah, for people to reach out to the because there are questions around the Naira equivalent for some of the courses and oh the uh, Naira equivalents are there you can just send a mail to praiseforway at gmail.com okay um, so I'll put that there praise for at gmail at gmail so feel free to reach me and um, talk to me we would see okay. how we can help you attend whatever you want to attend or whichever one strikes you Okay, so if you have specific questions about any of the classes or any of the programs on the website, you can send a message to praiseforwe at gmail.com and somebody will definitely get back to you. I saw one question that I'd like to take. Maybe this will be the last question before we let you go. Uh, there was one question about good cop, bad cop, and I'm going to tie it to this. Is it okay to give a child everything she asks for? My husband gives her daughter everything she, she would ask or cry for at the shop. And it ties into the previous question we got about good cop, bad cop, where it's like one parent wants to be the one in good light you, and the other one becomes, yeah. It, what is happening here is that you guys don't have a uniform template for raising that child. Um, parenting has extremes. The first extreme is to almost kill a child. The other extreme is to make everything available to the child. In this case, the child is becoming the parent. He's taking decisions. And you guys are running after the child. Um... I don't know why your husband is doing this, and um, I don't know what budget you guys have for that child and for your family, because there are so many things going on here. This is not a parenting problem first. This is, first of all, a marital problem I'm seeing, right? And so we will need to dig deeper than what I'm seeing here, um, but I don't think it's okay um, for you to buy everything your child wants to buy. So if the child points at an uh, iPad, are you going to buy? If the child cries and points at a car, are you going to buy? Because there are things you can buy for a child that will kill the child. True that. And that's the truth. So um, you are, the two of you want to sit down and say, what parenting templates are we using? Um, so maybe you need to go through my class or something. Um, and if some of the classes are self-paced on the website as well. Uh, all kinds yeah. of courses. You know, you and your husband need to draw up, I mean... You know, it, it's not, we are seeing it right now. My class is very intensive. Ask Marina. You have it to create, is, actually. I'm, I'm not even sure they have been, you have to keep creating templates and templates and templates. You can actually run a script for your child, you know, into their future. So I think that's what is happening here. Uh, you and your husband needs to sit down and ask, where do, who do we see this child um, in the future? And who is this, this child capable of becoming? And who must we become to get this child to be there? It might not be the right strategy to maybe your husband is just excited that i have a girl child and he wants to make that girl child happy well, your husband you you are the first girl child in that family absolutely so, husband, i want to be pointing at everything you know so let him be buying everything you are pointing at he wants to spend money on the culture okay so blossom mary says are you also a married coach yes praise is also a married coach yeah yes if you have questions or there's um, um, specific help you're looking for, the email address is on the screen, praiseforwe at gmail.com, and you will find the answers that you are looking for. Oh, guys, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Praise. I have an idea. I have an idea. What
what your schedule is like for yes. honoring us and blessing us with the last hour and a half we don't take it for granted at all we're very very grateful all of us on behalf of the 16,000 plus members of my youtube community want to say a big thank you and we're looking forward to having you back he says he's going to come back you guys before praise comes back we are 100, um, about 120 people on this live call right now. I want at least 30 people to go on his website and sign up for something. Go and check what is relevant to you and sign up for it. Let praise know that Marina Army has invaded that website. You guys know how we do it. You guys know how we do it. Even if it's just to go and pay for one class, sign up for something. And tell them oh, that you're from Marina Army. You guys, please don't disgrace me. I finished making them out here now. Don't disgrace me. Please, I'm begging all of you. Go on the website. If you have questions, email him. Let us harass that website. Don't crash it. Sir. Just make sure that you're doing something there. Well, we're going to uh, let Mr. Praise go now. It has been an amazing conversation. I can go on and on. But Praise, thank, thank you, you so much for your time. My thank pleasure. you so much, everyone who joined okay. us today. Make sure you share this video, guys. Everybody, as many people need to hear what we heard today the replay is going to be on my channel but share it share it share it to your friends for those of you in whatsapp groups for those of you who are in groups looking for how to migrate to canada this is part of what you will need to learn when you come here oh yeah so that we will not have, uh, migrating to canada will not have become prayer points because you have come here and everything is upside down so this is information you need to arm yourselves with okay so please share it as much as you can uh thank you very much everybody thank you so much next Saturday or Sunday, I'm going to be coming to you with another professional. We'll be talking about another area. So I'll see you guys when I come. Okay. Oh, okay. I think Chris um, stepped off now. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Eteng, let's go viral. This video, share it as much as you can, you guys. This information, Praise has given to us for free. So please, please do me a favor. Go on the website. Go and check out something. Let Praise know that something happened on his website today. You guys do that for me, okay? Well, thank you every very much, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to be ending the broadcast here, and I'll see you guys tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., okay? Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes, the people who are already downloading, go ahead. Keep downloading. Keep downloading. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.